Hello everyone, Karnasa Games here, and welcome to a new series on this channel. And as the title screen may suggest, this is going to be called Kerbal Gets Real. And that is because we are playing KSP, but we are playing it with as many realism mods as I dare. We have Real Solar System, we have RP1, and we have, of course, Realism Overhaul. And, well, the aim is to try and overcome these difficult challenges and see where we can get our fledgling space agency. We start in 1951, and the overall goal of this series will be to perform the impossible, to land man on Jupiter. Well, obviously we're not really going to be landing man on Jupiter, because that would be a rather silly idea, but we, we have high hopes for this series. But uh, one thing I really want to do is actually kind of land man on Mars. That would be something that I'd really quite like to do because I've not actually yet done that in Realism Overhaul with Kerbalism. So that's a goal, I think, for, for a long time in the future. But anyway, what we're seeing on screen now is the first launch actually being constructed. Yes, I have done this video in all kinds of weird orders because due to the magic of editing, I can kind of do that and give you some nice fancy cinematic shots to entice you in to begin with. And then we can go through and actually see the construction of that. This thing here is based on a real life rocket. It's probably one of the only ones that I will be basing completely on a real life rocket because I don't really want to go down that route, I want to kind of try and imagine my own things, but yes, if you want to look it up, this thing is based on a rocket used by the American army in the 1940s called the WAC Corporal, and well, it's it's a very good rocket for the first launch, it does exactly what it needs to do, and then what you can do is you can go and get a bit of glue, attach this decoupler to the bottom, stick a tiny tin booster on, just like that, you saw me do it just there, and then you can break the Kármán line with a very, very simple design, which is of, it's going to be the second contract we pick up. Well, it gets us a lot of money. So these first two rockets are going to, it's basically my bread and butter, the staple start of a RP-1 career. So we are left in the launch plumes of the Back Sergeant 2. This time it's got a booster and once again we're going to be treated to some lovely little cinematic flybys of this quite small little thing as it makes its way towards space. The objective of this one is to break the Kármán line and well, <laughs> I, I am going to apologise here a little bit because that's been... Well, it's rather nauseating, and there's there's not really much I could do, and well, I could either make these videos be very long, or, well, in the future, we won't really suffer this spin as much. Obviously, well, it's, the reason why this is spinning as much as it is is because I have angled those tail fins on the bottom of the rocket slightly, so it, well, so it does spin. I need it to spin, because I need that spin stabilization to make sure it goes up and in the correct way that I want it to. We don't want this thing zooming into some poor Floridian man's back garden or house or something. No, that would be terrible. We would probably have to write a very, very long letter of apology. And, well, I, uh, I'm not sure if we can afford the paper at the moment, really. All of our funds need to go on actually developing our space program. But here is the final stages of this little rocket's flight. And it did, it did achieve breaking the common line, which is exactly what we wanted it to do. So that was, all in all, a rather perfect launch. And let's watch it as it falls gracefully to the ground, smashing in hard after a little bit of lag. So yes, we successfully managed to breach the common line. We went 100 kilometers up and well, that's exactly what we, we needed to do. With that being done, we are now able to accept the next two main contracts that we are going to try and achieve with our space agency, and that will be to hit that all-important 3,000 kilometers downrange and to hit a suborbital trajectory and return safely. Also picking up just a intermediate, no, not intermediate, a difficult-sounding rocket contract just for a little bit of extra funds. But something that we managed to do 
which was rather <laughs> should have probably done before. On that second launch, we turned on all of our scientific equipment, so we can actually go into research and development. On the first launch, I forgot to do that until halfway through the actual launch, which meant I only got half a science point, which quite clearly is not enough to get any science done. I just went there and I picked up all of the post-war early nodes, basically all of the ones that cost one science at the beginning. Now I have come back out into the main screen and I'm just going to fiddle around with Kerbal Construction Time just to get my build times up a little bit so that when we build this next rocket, it won't take quite as long. And now that we're in the third rocket that we're designing, one thing I want to talk a little bit about here is the actual kind of formatting and style of this series that I'm going to be doing. This episode is going to be called 1951 because it is going to be all of the events that happen in 1951. And I thought that would be a good kind of starting point to really, well, start off the series. It's a, a nice round number, a year in the life of Karnasa Space Agency, I guess is what you could say. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's what my plans are originally, is to basically just do a lot of super fast time lapse through all of these, including the actual construction of the rockets, which is obviously what's going on here. If people would rather see a more in-depth and, well, yes, more kind of how I actually go around designing these, I would be more than happy to actually maybe do some episodes as kind of like just pure building episodes to show you kind of more what goes into these designs and how they how they work and how they achieve what they are supposed to do. I am not the most clued up on this. I am going to give you that little bit of a disclaimer there. I I have been playing Kerbal Space Program since it was in early beta. It might have even been alpha. I can't remember. I've been playing it for a very long time. I think I've had it since the beginning of 2013. I've been playing it on and off. It is one of my all-time favourite games. Uh, I, I, I just love it. But still, I've only been playing Realism Overhaul for about a year and a half now. So I would like to think I am relatively clued up. And playing Realism Overhaul has got me into a lot more just in, in terms of like space exploration. I'm a lot more interested in that now than I was when I started it. And it's this, that is one of the, the great merits of KSP, I would have to say. Like, before KSP came out, I had no idea about orbital mechanics at all. I had absolutely no idea. I didn't know how, how like, orbital, orbital mechanics work. Yes, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I had absolutely no clue whatsoever. KSP, obviously, kind of, it's a very steep learning curve game. It kind of taught me a little bit about that. And, yeah, it's... It, it really, really, like, piqued my interest in this whole kind of area of science. I do quite like science. I am currently studying computer science at uni, and I have done chemistry at uni as well before, and so I, I, I do enjoy science, but I'd never really been into anything like this. Which, yeah, no, KSP is just absolutely fantastic at kind of doing that, and I think it's a real kind of homage, not homage, like, it's a real kind of, I can't think of the word, the game, the game is really great for introducing new people to, to space exploration, space flight, and orbital mechanics and all of that, that, that generally might not actually pick up the topic. And it, it certainly has done for me, and it has made me incredibly fascinated in this whole area of kind of science. And, and yeah, because, I mean, yeah, no, I, I've gone in since playing, well, definitely since playing Realism Overhaul, I have gone in and I have looked up kind of all kinds of things that NASA did during the 50s, 60s, 70s, just because I, I kind of wanted to, 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 to succeed in Realism Overhaul, and one way to succeed is to copy proved, tried and tested designs, which, yeah, obviously, they, they are tried and tested, they worked, they worked for a reason, so if I could copy them in, in that, then I could actually, you know, make my own designs in Realism Overhaul work rather well, but that's that pretty much. Uh, yeah, no, that was me just <laughs> kind of droning on for a little bit whilst this rocket was constructed. And this is going to be called the White Needle. This is my attempt at reaching suborbital and returning safely. 
And it should hopefully definitely do that. I mean, it does have enough Delta V to achieve this. We have attached a biological sample onto it as well to get all that important science that we can. It's got a parachute. It should work. But yeah, let's launch this thing and see what happens. So here we have the maiden voyage of the White Needle 1 in glorious 4 times speed. Yes, I am going to speed this up because otherwise I would not be able to fit the entire of 1951 into this video. And yes, we're treated to some lovely cinematic shots of this as it makes its way towards space and look at what just happened. Test light, you absolute pain. No, we lost the engine on that, unfortunately, which means this thing is not going to get anywhere near as high as we would have liked it to have done. We are barely going to hit 64 kilometers, but all is not at a loss because even though this thing didn't make it into space, we are still going to get a rather large amount of science from it because it's going to be the first launch that we have ever recovered safely. It, we still will recover this safely because it does have that parachute attached to it and we can see it coming down now. And because it's the first thing that we've recovered safely, even though it didn't break the atmosphere, we are still going to get a whopping five science points from this launch, which will be enough to research us some new tech nodes. So let's get into R&D now. This is once again, super, super, super quick. And we can kind of work our way to some of the more advanced technologies. I think we picked up basic science there. So that way we can actually, you know, kind of get more science. You need to spend science to get more science. And we've just, well, warped ahead to the next iteration of rockets that we have. So let's go into the vehicle assembly building here and let's do a little bit of rejiggery magic on the White Needle 1. With basic rocketry, I think we unlocked a few new upgrades for the RD100 engine. So we now have the RD101, which is considerably better but also burns a lot more fuel so what we're going to need to do with this we're going to stretch this tank out and at first i remember when i built this rocket i thought wow this looks rather elongated now it looks a lot longer and a little bit silly but actually coming back and looking at it i think i prefer the look of this to the original white needle one it seems like it is more in fitting so basically with that rocket, with that upgrade, that technology upgrade that we've got, this is going to be the attempt to break 3000 kilometers down range. And this thing definitely has enough Delta V. When we use the XASR Aero B engine on this, combined with the RD101, I think we just about breach 6,000 meters per second delta V. There we go, yes, no, we had 6,033 meters per second of delta V there. That is definitely enough to hit 3,000 kilometers down range. And the way to do this, if, if you don't know, if you've not seen enough of these sounding rocket contract videos, what we wanna do is we have a two-stage rocket. This is basically based on the WAC bumper rocket where it was a WAC Corporal just strapped on to a V2 rocket, I believe. I may be wrong on that. I think that's right. But we stick a WAC Corporal, which is that thing at the top. That's going to be the second stage. And the first stage will be the, the big rocket. And that should be enough once we pitch it to about two and a half degrees to get us to 3000 kilometers down range. But in the meantime, we are going to be waiting for the second white needle to be built. And hopefully this one will succeed where the other one failed. Yes, the other one obviously was rather upsetting. We lost out on that return safely contract and we also didn't achieve the payload. That is a thing. I do have about 250 units of sounding rocket payload on these white needle launches, which will hopefully be enough to future proof several missions of this style so i have tooled them up and here we go here is the angled launch and you can see we had an ignition failure we had two ignition failures it took it to the third activation of that engine to actually make it work and now luckily because i was still on the launch pad i could reignite that engine had that been done mid-flight no we would not have had a successful launch which would have been really upsetting but the ignition failure chance of this was only 5%, I believe. And the fact that we had 
two ignition failures on launch and we've also had a failure of the engine mid-flight as well. That is very, very, very unlucky. I have not been lucky at all with these launches and you can see me there. I decoupled the kind of little payload that is going to get us all the way up to, it looks like, yes, 286,000 meters up. So this thing, this thing has definitely gone into space. Now comes the tricky part of actually returning it safely. Hopefully we didn't go too high and actually make this thing burn up as it enters the atmosphere because, well, that would be really, really, really bad if that did. And yeah, coming down, I think this is the Gulf of Mexico, I want to say. But there we go, we're getting that rigorous re-entry heating, but luckily everything manages to survive. And now, if that parachute goes off, we have successfully completed the, the, the main contract, the one where suborbital trajectory and return safely, and it looks like everything has gone swimmingly. <laughs> Especially as it landed in the middle of the ocean. Yes, that was terrible, I apologize. One thing we didn't manage to do with that, which is rather upsetting, is we didn't do the payload one because I detached the top bit, which didn't have the payload with it before we actually hit the altitude that they wanted. That was really silly of me, so I have to go back and do that again. I don't know if you saw, but we got a whole whopping 27 science from that launch. So we are able to go through and get pretty much everything that we need to get a rocket to orbit. And we are still only in 1951. Well, that is what this episode is called. This is going to be just 1951. This is me being very confused at why I didn't actually achieve that sounding rocket contract. Yes, I didn't realize at the time. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. But as I was saying, yes, we've got all of that research queued up but unfortunately it's going to take quite a long time to actually research that like i've said we are playing with kerbal construction time research doesn't get done instantly no it's like the rockets we have to actually wait around for them to get built we have to wait around for research to happen as well which yeah Hopefully, at the rate we're going, we might, we might be able to push for orbit in, say, 1955, I want to say. I think 55 is the earliest that I've ever done. But enough of talking about future things. This is now White Needle 2. This is the downrange rocket. Can we hit 3,000 kilometers downrange in 1951, the first year of this space agency? It is possible. I did run this thing through some test flights using Crash, and it did. It successfully managed to get the contract. It fulfilled the contract, and that, that was brilliant. So, let's see. I'm, I'm just checking here everything, making sure that everything is exactly as it should be. My staging is correct. We have hit that ignition, and we have a launch, and this thing is soaring rather graciously once again up towards the cloud level. There we go, we've got that little bit of spin. It is going to be spin stabilized to keep it generally in the direction that we want it to go and not tip over and once again smash into something that it shouldn't do. But I mean, we are heading out over the Atlantic Ocean so there won't be any major obstacles in our way in that direction. So that shouldn't be too much of an issue. But look at that thing go. That's really starting to get a bit of a spin now. And of course, it was going to happen. Test light, once again, has been a real thorn in my side. It has meant that this, this glorious launch, the White Needle 2, that was supposedly going to get 3,000 kilometers downrange, was a failure. And because we are in November in 1951, I think. No, no, we are in October. I tell a lie, it is the 30th of October. We do not have enough time to build another one of those and try and launch that before the end of 1951, which is really kind of sad because I really would have liked to have hit that contract before the end of 1951. As it goes, it will almost certainly be the first thing that I will be launching next episode because at the end of this one we are just going to relaunch another white needle this is this is the problem with realism overhaul at the start it is a lot of 
grind. There is a lot of sounding rocket grind. It's, it's all you can do, basically, to get the science and the funds to get to where you need to be. So you need to repeatedly launch the same rocket over and over again, potentially getting slightly higher and slightly better results than the first. And when you're playing with Kerbalism as well, you've obviously science experiments going to get done instantly. So you need to kind of go up and again because you're not keeping anything in orbit at the start because you, the aim is to actually try and achieve orbit and orbit in in real life being about 9,400 meters a second, we are way off that. Our best rocket at the moment, which is that White Needle 2, has around 6,000. We still need an extra three and a half thousand meters per second of Delta V to actually achieve orbit. Even then, in early rocket designs, you probably want more like 10,000 because it's, well, they're not guided all the way. Well, like the upper stage won't be, the, the starting stages usually will be. But here we, here we have another successful launch of the White Needle, White Needle 1. And yeah, it, it performed its job amicably. It did everything we wanted it to do. And look at that lovely, is that a sunset or a sunrise that is coming from the, the east? That's that lovely sunrise. That's a rather glorious little shot, isn't it? And there we go, once again, splashing down, I think, in the Gulf of Mexico for our final flight of 1951. Well, it may have been our final flight, but we do have a little bit more that we can do before the year is well and truly out. We can go through and get some new contracts as we finally managed to complete that sounding rocket payload contract because I wasn't an idiot and separated it before the payload actually got to the required altitude. We can also check our science and that mission got us a fair bit more science so we can go and get even more in the queue, which is obviously going to take a long time. We are gonna to have to look into actually upping the amount of research that we can do a year because this is going to take a really long time to research all of this. So that is definitely one thing that we will be focusing on in the future, but yeah. That's, that's 1951 guys, let's warp ahead these last few weeks to actually get to the 1st of January 1952, but that will come in the next episode. If you have enjoyed this video, please do go give it a like. If you have really enjoyed it and want to keep up with this series and my channel, why not consider subscribing as well? I do have another Let's Play series that's going on at the moment in a game called RimWorld called The Kingdom of Beck. If you are interested in that, why not go and check that out as well? There will be a link at the end of this video here. But I have been Karnasa Games and I will see you all later.